Hey there, comrades. Welcome to this week's episode of Red Library. Thanks for joining us this week and every week for icy cold takes on your favorite works of theory, philosophy, history, political theory, various combinations of the above. On this week's episode, we have the first of a two-parter with our most excellent returning comrade from our Lenin 2017 episodes, Comrade Alex. He's back on the show this week to pick up where we left off from our reading of Zizek's Lenin 2017, and this time we're going to tell tackle Zizek's arch nemesis, his frenemy, the communist Maoist philosopher Alain Badiou. We're going to be working through his book called Philosophy for Militants, a book mainly focused on the relationship between politics and philosophy, but as you might expect with me and Comrade Alex, if you listen to those Lenin 2017 episodes, it's going to be a hell of a lot more than that that we talk about. That's why we're doing two parts. I am happy to say that this one is very theory heavy. It's very dense, but it's also hella funny. I think it's hella funny anyway, but I'm biased. I mean, I'm on the episode. What do you expect? But we're going to cover a vast range of topics. This first part is mostly going to get into Elaine Badiou's history, some of his philosophical projects, and setting up some basic questions that help us think through what the purpose of philosophy is, how it relates to politics, and different aspects of Elaine Badiou's thought that he's most well known for, such as his concept of the event with the cat capital E, and a whole bunch of other good stuff. Something else that's pretty special about this episode, it also inaugurates a new series we're going to be doing here on Red Library, mostly with Comrade Alex, and we're going to call it Real Late Night Philosophy Hours. So after you listen to this one, I'm sure you will see why. All right, y'all, we hope you enjoy the episode this week and part two coming at you next week. In the meantime, remember to support Red Library, support the work we're doing in any number of ways, subscribe to the show, share the show with one friend this week, just one. That's all you got to do, just one person. Hell, you don't even have to know them, just randomly email it to them, let's see what happens. Head over to Patreon, we have a bunch of new tiers set up, and we're going to be dropping our first premium episode in the next week or so. So if you'd like to get access to that, you can basically pitch in, and that will get you all the premium content we're going to be coming out with over the next, uh, well, I guess indefinitely, since now we're doing that. That's a thing that we do. All right, remember to follow us on Facebook, like the page, follow us on Twitter, shoot us an email, all that other good stuff. You know the drill. I'll see you back here afterward. Enjoy the show. Watch out for those air horns. Welcome to this week's episode of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. I have the extraordinary, triumphant return of our most excellent comrade, Alex. Hey, it's me. How are you guys? Wow, that was nice. It was very cordial. Sometimes people, you know, they don't come in real strong, but that was really nice. You know, I was, I was trying to, that, there was something that I wanted to do with it, but I just, you know, it, it, I lost it, so... Well, it's all right. I mean, because this week's episode, I mean, this might be a two-parter, let's be honest. It tends to go that way with us, it seems. That's sort of my expectation. I'd, I'd be okay with that. I it's mean. real late-night philosophy hours on Red Library. ASMR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> philosophy hours on Red Library. Welcome to Red Library. Welcome to Red Library. Okay, so... <laughs> Why is it? It's taken us 34 episodes to make an ASMR <laughs> show. <laughs> Dude, I, I don't know, honestly. I'm ready for like an actual ASMR podcast. Like, I'll I'll come in like leather and heels and I'll grow my nails out, man. You just let me know what I got to do. Well, you know, starting and... in next month, we're going to be doing uh, patron exclusive episodes. So maybe okay. that will be. I'll let you run that one. You'll <laughs> have like an ASMR to... series. <laughs> Pay to see me like really fuck up an ASMR broadcast. Actually, I want you doing reading Plato's Republic oh, ASMR style. Oh, oh, come on, no less, dude. You know, I feel like Wait, that would what are fit we doing about you show? today? I mean, come on, man. Like, I mean, anything, anything you want. I'll, you know, I'll bust out the Zizek. You know, I love Zizek. Yeah, that's you right. Know? I'm well, not that... going to do any impressions though, because fuck that. That's stupid. Well, I feel like I'm usually the one who tries to do the impressions on the show, so I think I'll I'll have that covered, and you know, you can just give me critical feedback. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you very critical feedback. That. That's why you're here, because you have the best critical feedback. Okay. So what? Do, I was almost going to ask you, like, what are we here to talk about? I'm like, oh, shit, I'm leading this um, <laughs> Who's leading this outfit? Yeah. Like all things in reality, agency and leadership and uh, some sort of name of the father that's going to ascribe some kind of meaning to the general social functioning is just an illusion, right? It's a phantom. Yeah. I, I, uh, yes. Yes. I'm going to go with Yes. <laughs> Uh, that felt very targeted. I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm here. I've got like a, like a giant black 
phallic object in front of me, and I just don't know how to respond. I feel like I can't look at it. It's fine. <laughs> don't make it's eye contact fine. with <laughs> the microphone. Don't, don't make eye contact. Eye contact. <laughs> there is something else that I wanted to sort of drop and uh, share with the listeners, but also share with you too, because God, you were on. You were on episode three and four. Yeah, you yeah. Were here was at cool. the very beginning. Yeah. So yeah, we man. did Lenin 2017 by Ride or Die. Slavaj Zizak. Slavaj Zizak. <laughs> I'm not sure how to actually pronounce his name. Is it Zizak? Is it no? Oh, it's G- oh Zizak. I'm getting from from the uh, from the back, from the quoting room. They're telling me it's Zizak from the from the very uh, large uh, <laughs> Soviet <laughs> party official standing over your shoulder right now. Oh yeah, it's Zizak. You know, I sat with him. I shook his hand. I, I you know. That's right. Person. We both have like, actually you know, been cool. in the same presence at Zizek. Uh, we actually went to a lecture of his. It was cool. It was weird because like when I first saw him and I saw him talking, I my brain didn't know what to do. Like it was like, it, it's not, it's just like an avatar of him or something. But then, yeah. it, you know, congealed and I was like, oh yeah, he's just right there. That's cool. I remember we were walking down the hallway at the college he was giving the lecture at and you heard his voice reverberating through the hallway. Yeah, he, and it was, was one of the, the most surreal part. experiences. It was. It was very strange. It really was. I mean, yeah. pretty. It was a pretty cool talk that he did. I was like. I thought it was you know, excellent. I, I think you and I had talked about this afterward, but you know, whenever people have that sort of critical edge and talk about Zizek, one of the things I always pretty hardcore defending uh, in terms of him is just like I've seen him sit in a lecture room full of people and him engage with people in a genuine one on one way that I think you would very rarely if ever see from someone who is as prolific and well known as he is as like a political thinker and philosopher. I, was, I, I remember being astonished to watch him do that and it sort of fall in love with a lot of his work and thinking all over again, just seeing him actually just how he interacted with people yeah it, it was almost like one <laughs> this is gonna sound i am just completely obsessed with this man no but like i, I mean you it, said it that right away things. like whenever yeah. you first came on the show yeah yeah i mean there's no way i can deny it you know like if you go into my house you look at my bookshelf like instantaneously you're like okay this guy's a problem it was like one of those moments where after it was over i was like in in you know shock and awe or whatever and i just felt fulfilled and i think i remember thinking to myself that night when i went to bed i was like I think I can like die now. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I say that jokingly, but I actually meant it. Like it felt cool. Like I was like, I yeah. feel like I participated in something meaningful here. Yeah. Um, not that I thought that I wanted to die or anything like that. You know, it wasn't like his lecture made me feel like killing myself. It was the opposite. It made me feel fulfilled. <laughs> so please don't misinterpret. I really like Zizek. I wasn't, yeah, anyway. Just for any <laughs> listeners, I know you're going to be listening to this after we record, so the temporality of this is going to make no sense. But please do not start calling, like, 1-800-HELPLINES yeah, about yeah, Alex. No, I know I, Epstein has recently committed suicide. We've lost Jeffrey Epstein, and everyone's very aware of suicidality and the importance of awareness about suicide. But don't worry, everything's under control. It was a good experience. We're all fine. Yeah, yeah, we're all good. I'm still here. Um, Zizek is still here. Alain Badu, by extension, yeah. is, is also still here, right? He's still alive, right? Yeah, he <laughs> okay. is. I mean, he's old as shit. Yeah, he's, he's still pumping he's out still books. Him, he's, he's still, still pumping him. out books. He just wrote one, basically, that's him talking to the youth. He's basically... The, it's just called Youth? Yeah, yeah. it's just like <laughs> Alain Badu talks this. to youth. No, you know what's... But wait, but didn't Zizek come out with a book called just Event? Yeah, he did. It was actually his... Well, this is actually pretty interesting. And we'll sort of get into this because this is why I think you being on for this episode is sort of the perfect follow-up to you being on to talk about Zizek and Lenin 2017 because we're reading a book by the French Maoist philosopher, political theorist, cranky old man, Alain Badiou. We're reading Philosophy for Militants, a very short, I think it's a trim, like 49 pages. It's incredibly short. I didn't realize how small the book was until I just showed up today and like I see you have it on the table and it's literally like a pocket-sized book. Yeah, it is. It's actually, I think the series, if I remember right, is some sort of like pocket radical bullshit from verso it's, it's, it's all it's all uh, radicals have time for today yeah it's just uh, writing it's unfortunately it's so books. busy doing all the radical things that they don't have any time to read any actual well there'll be a picture books. of the cover for whenever listeners listen to the episode but just to paint the picture and i have to tell you this is absolutely whenever i first heard about elaine badu which is actually through reading zizek because they're sort of i think of them as frenemies or yeah. they have like a loving rivalry. Yeah, and Zizek they're... described it, I believe, as he was the hysteric to Badiou's <laughs> master. Like Badiou is just stoic and calm and quiet. Yeah. And Zizek is like constantly like harassing him and asking him questions and trying to get clarification on things. That seems pretty accurate. Yeah. yeah. But just to paint you all a picture of the book itself, because we're very obviously concerned with just the aesthetics of all this shit. We really don't care about the content. But it is a just jet black cover of this book. <laughs> yeah. And in 
very uh, stark, bold letters. It says Philosophy for Militants by Elaine Badiou. And then there's just a picture of a fucking gun. On yeah. the <laughs> it's just got a, gun, a big red gun. A big red gun. The, the, yeah. the threat of communism, the ideal of communism is represented by a very large red, uh, sort of like platonic ideal of a firearm. You can't really tell what model of gun it is, but it is. Yeah. It's sort of like this, uh, this sort of simultaneously ideal and, and material representation. Yeah, it's got it's got this weird uh, texture to it. Like it looks like it's like made of stacks of cardboard. Oh yeah, and you're it right. reminds me of like a YouTube video I saw where somebody had an object like that, and then they like sat it on the ground and spread it out like accordion style, and it ended oh, up yeah. being like a giant bench. Yeah, you're right. Or something for people to sit on. Yeah, you're and right. So, yeah, anyway, it's almost it like me. yeah, like you could open up its pages as if it was a book itself. As if it actually was a book, and you actually can. Oh shit! You hear that? That's how deep Elaine Badiou is. <laughs> He's like I the book feel, itself is the gun. Feel. We symbology. have to pick up the book to put down the book, as Chairman Mao would say. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> so there's one other detail I want to make sure I drop before we continue our, our real late night philosophy hours on Red Library here. Yeah. Uh, so your episode, part one of Lenin 2017, is, I'm very proud to say, now our most downloaded episode. What? Uh, that's so great, dude. Yeah. Fucking awesome. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Why, yeah. though? I uh, well, I think it's probably a combination of, of Lenin... Being in the title, <laughs> Lennon but, and she said, "Yeah, I think so." But okay. yeah, yeah, I think it definitely yeah. like gets people's attention, I'd and it's click it. yeah. I mean, I would definitely click that shit. I'd <laughs> click it. Um, so. I'd click it even without a VPN, <laughs> even without you know Oof. no raw dog no. in it there, huh? Yeah, wait, you you know it, bro. You know I raw dog. Um, <laughs> a raw dog, no VPN, <laughs> no VPN, no proxies. <laughs> No proxies, bro. Um, anyway, sorry. This is I don't even know what we're talking about. That's anymore. all right. Well, we're just we're just setting the stage. We're just getting everyone acclimated to real philosophy hours. Also, I just realized that probably every episode we're gonna do together is just gonna be our real philosophy hours series on Red Library, and this is hey, just the vibe. That's this is the vibe. This this is actually what it, it's so like. If I just was like, hey, Adam, like, what you doing? And I hit him up, and we were just to hang out. Like, this is what we would do anyway. Yeah, so that's very did, true. Yeah, I was like, let's just put the microphones on. And let's stop that's actually a great point. It really is just, like, a pretty accurate representation of the exact kind of shit that we talk about and the way that we talk about it. So this is, you know, if the whole appeal of, like, YouTube videos and, like, posters and, all, and like, Twitch streamers is this feeling of you're just beginning to participate in a relationship because we all feel just terribly in despair and alone in our lives. I mean, we're really capturing that. This is what it would be like to just hang out in the room with us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I sort of I got, I got stuck on the terribly scared and alone part. And uh, sorry, just, I just, just went just into a really right dark over place that. in my... Just, just okay. take another sip okay, of your IPA. Just brush whew, over it. Just whew, drown those problems. Just drown them out. This is going to be the way we're going to do this episode, uh, which I actually think is kind of the perfect way to do Bad You, to, to sort of breathe some life into it. Because Bad You can be incredibly, incredibly hard to read. Very, very dense, very complex. Also, I just feel like it's a little opaque. I mean, it, unlike, unlike Zizek, um, where you can go online and find all of these resources and like listen to his takes on all this different stuff in all different kinds of ways. Just, you know, Bad You just doesn't have, there's just not really much you can do unless yeah. you talk to somebody who's read them and understand maybe go to, a, you know, you know, university, talk to a professor or something. It's, it's difficult to find a resource. I mean, of course there's stuff like this, you know, yeah. podcast, but which is, I, I don't think, know that Bad You yeah. is really all that like, like popular necessarily. It might be kind of hard. I haven't ever actually looked to see uh, how much is out there about Bad You, but I just know him peripherally because of how much engagement I have with Zizek and his work and it just always comes up and so I ended up reading quite a quite a bit of his commentary just by reading Zizek books you know yeah. what I'm saying like I think that was my exposure too it was almost at a certain point you read enough Zizek and you start absorbing some of Badiou's key arguments and concepts and philosophical work and sort of ends up inevitably leading you to say, okay, well, I want to read who the hell Elaine Badiou is and what exactly is Zizek drawing on here? So I think for both of us, that was kind of our introduction to him. I will say he has a number of smaller works, things like Philosophy for Militants that we're reading. He has this really interesting book too that's also quite small that I actually think will kind of touch on some of his core concepts, but it's called The Communist Hypothesis. It also is a very small pocket-sized book and it's pretty fascinating. It's a great encapsulation of some of his key ideas about communism communism and philosophy and set theory and mathematics and how all these things fit together. But his his sort of main work 
that I think was actually not translated into English because uh, it was published in French uh, because he happens to be French. Shock. Um, wait, wait, what? His name is Alain Badieu. Wait, wait, he's French? <laughs> yeah. He's, yo, he's from fucking Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> yo, yo, I thought he was from Jersey. <laughs> Well, he's from Southie, yeah. no, he's you know. Crazy. He's a <laughs> platonic <laughs> communist philosopher from Southie. <laughs> Used to work for the mob out there. Yeah, you know. Sorry, we're just being. I don't know. What we're, what we're being. <laughs> we're right having now. a good time. No, yeah, but, but real yeah, philosophy. He's, he's hours I mean, that's how he was rubbing elbows with all the fucking cats. You know, um, uh, what's his face? Uh, who's the guy? To, uh, is the head of the psychoanalytic society right now? Or, oh, Jacques Alain Miller. Yeah, Jacques Alain uh, Miller. He was a student of Louis Althusser. Yeah, Althusser. He so. also uh, is sort of notorious for kind of trolling uh, Gilles Deleuze. <laughs> in some of Deleuze's lectures, because we've mentioned Deleuze a little bit on the show. We haven't gone real in depth because other people do Deleuze, and it's not necessarily something we've tackled yet. But for anyone who isn't aware, Deleuze is this uh, very prominent, especially, I think, in certain areas of political theory and in different types of philosophy in the academy. But Deleuze is very famous. He's very odd, very quirky, very complicated theory and philosophy. And Badu would just like they would just like kick in the doors to his lectures and just start screaming malice shit at him and <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> he was kind of a hard dick. To imagine that. Yeah. Like, you know, uh a very like stuffy seeming old guy philosopher like from like an old era he's like yeah. alive in the you know may 68 kind of shit you know well i mean they got a little wild in may 68 there was they some did, there was some right? radical shit but happening. it's like yeah. these guys that you see now and, and you read their books and it's just like this heady stuff you know it's crazy to think that like in their youth they were screaming maoist shit at the yeah. in like public lectures and, and now they're just esoterically contemplating set theory and how this relates to the communist hypothesis in history so yeah so i was <laughs> i was also uh uh, mentioning before we kind of went on that digression, which is important and it is in my notes, is that he was sort of known for publishing these sort of key, like really, I think, pretty impactful and pretty fascinating major philosophical works. One was called Theory of the Subject that he published, I think, back in the late 70s, early 80s. But then he published one called Being an Event, which we're going to touch on some of its ideas here. And then his follow up to that was called Logic of Worlds. So he's kind of has made these attempts to publish these sort of like epoch-defining philosophical works, the same way that Plato would publish a, a sort of defining work of his era. Hegel's phenomenology defined his era, and Kant's different uh, critiques defined his era. I think Badiou is very consciously trying to write that type of work for his own era, thinking yeah. about May 68 and onward into today. You know, I mean, I guess the the sort of ambition here is is pretty large. Yeah, definitely. I mean, with philosophy for militants, maybe... You know, he's trying to condense some of those ideas to make something more practical for people every day. But like, yeah, yeah he's definitely, you know, had his hand in some very serious philosophical work. And I think, you know, he's definitely worth checking out. I like I like uh, his ideas a lot. You bring up something really important, too, which is why we chose to pick this book if we're going to talk about Badiou. I mean, I think one, just because Badiou is pretty fascinating, has some pretty challenging and interesting ideas about philosophy and its relationship to politics, but also he somehow manages to condense this into a 49-page set of essays <laughs> that cover a lot of ground and I think are a pretty fantastic introduction. I mean, I'm not saying this to, to sort of humble brag in any sort of way, as I don't necessarily recommend or even uh, am proud of the fact that I've read some of his longer books. But in many ways, it's like, just read this shit. Just read this <laughs> short-ass book. The, you're going to get everything you need. Yeah, don't this. read those other books. Just read this ones. And if you really, really want to horribly self-flagellate, then go read the longer ones. Yeah. I would say I agree, but then I'm the guy who reads all the fucking Zizek books. And so, like, you know, I feel like that's just as... He also you know, writes long books. Just as difficult an endeavor. And, like, you know, I do it for I do it for the Zizek. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's why that's why you're the the sort of sitting resident comrade for real philosophy hours on Red Library, because yeah. you also read that shit. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as well as I do, very few people have the time or patience to read that shit. Yeah, there's there's a deep, dark hole in my soul and it's empty. And oh, yeah. From its void, I can hear just like this, this slight call. And it's just says, Alex, just read philosophy. Just read more. The voices Is this that good for the ASMR. Yeah, <laughs> nihilist ASMR, <laughs> Ni nihilist philosophical void ASMR. <laughs> that should be the title of the episode. Oh shit, I've, that's gonna be in the subtitle for sure. All right. Yes, um, let's do it. Okay, so uh, let's maybe talk about a couple of other 
biographical points, uh, contextual points about Badiou, just to maybe kind of put him historically sort of on the trajectory that's going to eventually lead to this book. I think we had mentioned that Badiou was very active in the May 68 protests in France. He actually gained his first professorship around that same year. He actually became a full professor, I think, in Paris in 1969, where he was organizing groups of Maoist militant philosophy students to go yell at Deleuze in his lectures (laughs) um, and to be a hyper-trolling asshole. (laughs) So funny enough, uh, and I didn't know this before, but this explains a lot of Badiou's focus on mathematics. He actually was the son of a French mathematician, which I didn't know that prior to this, and now makes a lot of sense. Uh, He's really just trying to get daddy's recognition by doing all that (laughs) set theory in his philosophy books. Yeah, yeah, and I bet that's why he was drawn to Lacan, because of like all of the... All that daddy issue stuff. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say the, like, mathematical references, nah, but nah, nah. you're probably right. You probably I, I have a much more that. radical psychoanalytic <laughs> reading. It's easy as daddy issues. Yeah. Um, funny enough, his dad was also a, a member of the French Resistance and fought the Nazi regime whenever they occupied France. So wow. he's got some pretty legit radical revolutionary credentials there. Quite the, uh, was I going to say something about a mantle, but I don't think that's the correct expression. That's quite the uh, lineage. I don't know. <laughs> Quite, quite the uh, crest to put over your mantle. Is that what I was going to say? I that don't sounds, know. Oh, it's almost like a family crest. <laughs> yeah, kind of like thing. it's quite the... Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Let's yeah. go with that. Okay, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. <laughs> moving on. So one thing I, I kind of... I have a feeling we're going to be going back and forth on a lot of this stuff. But there is something I kind of wanted to touch on with Bad U's sort of political history. And I'm curious sort of what you think about this, too. Okay. I think a lot of times whenever we read sort of academic philosophers who, you know, are writing about leftist politics or like identify as communists or socialists or whatever, I think there's this idea that they're somehow disconnected from political parties, from from actual political work on the ground. So Badiou actually was one of the founding members of what was called the Unified Socialist Party, or PSU, and he was actually really involved in a lot of the decolonization struggles in Algeria. So one of the things that I think even for me, whenever I got involved with Badiou, I was like, oh, this is obviously like really dense academic philosophy. Didn't really have an awareness of his connection to actual political organizing work and, and an actual you know party and communist group. But surprise, surprise, he actually does have that in his background. Yeah, yeah. He totally does. And I think that's kind of a, actually, there's probably, I don't know, there's some academics, which, you know, maybe if you read them, they wouldn't have any real relation to like the philosophical things that they talk about. But like, I don't know, I think it's more common to find people writing philosophy that have some, some basis in experience, like, yeah. you know, dealing with what it is that they're writing about, as opposed to people who are just like, uh, what would we call nasal navel gazers, uh, yeah. just uh, pontificating. Yeah, he's definitely legit in terms of at least being really close to a movement not only just close to it and participating in it, but like during a time when it was like on fire and people were like extremely interested in what was happening in the left and what was going to change and how, yeah. you know, society was going to be different as a result of the of those changes. So. They shut down the whole damn country for, for a little bit there in France during May 68. I mean, it's pretty mm-hmm. incredible. And like the Gaulle fled the country. I mean, it was it was shit got wild, son. Yeah. Yeah. She was lit like Dubai. Yes, yeah, she was lit. <laughs> That's like my historical Dubai. analysis of May 68. <laughs> Shit was lit like Dubai. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, Dubai is lit. Have y'all seen Dubai? I mean, yeah, it's very lit. Well, let's let's talk about, I think, someone very near and dear to our heart, which is the French psychoanalytic philosopher, Jacques Lacan. Yes. So Badiou, very, very influenced by Lacan. And actually, Badiou was a student of Althusser. So that's kind of his pedagogical pedigree, Yeah, I would say. That was unnecessary to say it that way. Yeah, there's a lot of alliteration. There's there. alliteration. It's so it's a pretty positive pedagogical pedigree he has there, people. <laughs> what are you drinking? I'm, sorry, you're I'm drinking, in your house right you're now. Drinking, yeah, you're in my house, son. <laughs> house rules. Respect my house rules. Because let's say it's been God thirty episodes since you've been on. That's shocking to think about. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. You know, we've made passing references to Jacques Lacan throughout a lot of different episodes, but. Lacan figures very much into Zizek's work as well, and also Bad Use. That's a really big influence they both share. So maybe how would you summarize at least Lacan's importance in philosophy and politics and his influence on people like Bad and Zizek? How would you describe that to someone who has no awareness of why he's important? I guess what I would say about Lacan is that if he's not central, he is one of the most central uh, philosophers that a lot of the work that Badiou and Zizek are doing is in response to 
you know, if you if you write a, a criticism of a philosopher's major work, a lot of your work will then forever be associated with that philosopher. Yeah, well, they're true, doing yeah. criticisms of Lacan yeah. and Hegel. Mm-hmm. You know, that's like what it's like what defines uh, a lot of their work. And and obviously, Lacan is like in the realm of psych- psychoanalysis, and so it's like one of those uh, subjects or those like topics of philosophical knowledge that most people don't encounter in any mm-hmm. other kind of way. It's interesting how it weds up to philosophy and how like how productive of a lens it can be, yeah, I guess, absolutely. when you use it to try to make sense of some contemporary sociological, political issues, like talking about capitalism and why people are drawn to it and how it functions so effectively. I mean, my God, if if, if it wasn't for psychoanalysis, I don't know if we'd have any insight into that beyond <laughs> beyond Marx. That's <laughs> like, actually <laughs> such a great point that in, in some ways, the legacy of, of Lacan and even I think about the Frankfurt School, I mean, their whole approach is essentially what gives us that legacy of trying to understand, okay, how is it that capital affects us as people, as individual subjects, and how it constructs our world, our desires, yep. our sense of self, our identity, and all these other things. Yeah, definitely. And so, at least today, I feel like there's very few people more steeped in Lacan than someone like Badiou or yeah. like Zizek. You know, these guys are, they're just up there. And they're they are in polemics with one another. They kind of like, yeah, they go back and forth, and they have like an active thing going on where... You know, one will write a book, the other one will write a book in response or like come out and do lectures and saying, oh, I don't like his idea there or his idea there. And they, they just have a way, at least in contemporary times, they have a way of bringing Lacan, who, you know, was doing something 50, 80 years ago. Yeah. And yeah, a long time ago now. bringing something that's that was done so long ago and it seems like from a different generation, a different era into mm-hmm. relevance today and making it like probably more relevant, at least to me as a reader of philosophy, more relevant than a lot of other uh, lenses that are used to like make sense of problems that are happening in contemporary politics. So Yeah, and I think um, what you were saying too is really important and it kind of leads us to another thing that we always like to start with, which is, you know, what's the relevance of this? Why read this book? And it does seem that Badiou's relationship of trying to tie together a kind of structural Marxism with Lacanian psychoanalysis leads to a very, very particular approach, a very particular set of critiques and a set of I would say like philosophical analyses that I think are very, very strongly tied to his wedding together of those two different schools of thought. So in a lot of ways, if you want to understand why we're going to talk about the specific concepts and questions that he poses in this book, we got to also understand, you know, where is he coming from? Like, why are these the particular sorts of approaches he's taking to these problems of the relationship relationship between philosophy and politics? Yeah, it's really interesting in the sense that how relevant it is. I mean, I, I, is this book, when is this book from? So it was actually published in 2012. 2012. So not that okay. long ago. It's not that long ago. Yeah. But I think since then, things have become more and more and more centered around sort of this this perspective on like the speculation of where is the proletariat? Like who who is it that is proletarian? Who who are we fighting for? Who who is it that needs to lead this revolution? I mean, gamers, obviously. Yeah, yeah rise up, <laughs> rise up, gamers. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, I mean, you know, maybe some, probably not. I don't know. <laughs> Fuck, man, that's I don't another even question. Know what, what is the Venn diagram between the proles and the gamers? <laughs> Jesus, Christ. this is Pepe is just floating around yeah. the room, smiling. <laughs> Why are people happy? Um, I no, but I think it's an like an extremely relevant like little snippet of of philosophy because he that's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about you know, like how how can we talk about subjectivity? Mm-hmm. How can we relate politics and philosophy? Like where does that come together? And I mean, you know, what better place for those two things to come together than in you, the subject yeah, of leftist leftist politics? So of course, you know, invoking names like Althusser. I mean, come on, like talking about interpolation and like, you know, what, what is it that you, that subjectivizes you or what is it that makes you, you know, subordinate to the, to the goals, to the things in your life that motivate you or pull you in the directions that you were pulled. Like there's such a discussion on the left today of like, who's legit? What are your credentials? Where do you come from? What's your background? Yeah, uh, what are your politics? And then it just becomes this like weird virtue signaling, like fucking slosh ball, weird <laughs> shit. I don't know. And well, like slosh the, ball is pretty accurate. Slosh yeah. ball, <laughs> slosh ball is slosh ball is from today's, uh, today's episode brought to you by <laughs> slosh ball. I, I think that it's, it's very relevant. And why should you read it well you know he's got some very insightful things to say about subjectivity in yeah. politics i feel like that one of the things you and i have shared over the years of us knowing each other and talking about these sorts of things and reading through them is that maybe because we both share this love of philosophy and lacan and psychoanalysis it feels that we're 
we're very, very critical of the ways that subjectivity is deployed in leftist politics. And I think we both kind of use this similar framework to step back and say, let's look at the way that subjectivity, our identity, how we conceive of ourselves as agents in the world, how we think we're developing knowledge and what are our philosophical assumptions. You know, it's coming from this sort of approach. And I think yeah. it's been incredibly productive and I think led to a way to see things to identify maybe problems or ways that capital sort of infiltrates and, you know, spider webs its way through our experience of the most basic fundamental aspects of the world. Because I think you and I are both on the same page that this is absolutely the level in which we have to be able to step back and critique and use philosophical tools and analysis to understand. So for me, I guess, you know, the more I think about this, the more it's like, oh, yeah, it's because we both like read all this kind of shit. <laughs> yeah. That's why we have a, a sort of special focus on that, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In the era of being able to get a word into a conversation because somebody has identified you in some kind of way that is, you know, toxic to the yeah. structure of the group or like, you know, just in, in a world where you have to like declare what kind of pronouns you use before you start saying what you were going to say. Thinking about know. the DSA convention video uh, that's been going around watch and the getting super a lot cut, of you know, yeah. Um, but like, yeah, it, it's it's a uh, God, you know, like I'm not trying to shit on the DSA, but <laughs> God, man, like that was a that was a very hard to watch thing. Um, yeah. To just see pretty divisive for even people in the DSA to watch that. Yeah. Now they have a caucus that's called like "Let Them Clap" or something. Yeah, please, please let them clap or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah Je the Jeb, the Jeb 2020 the caucus. Jeb 2020. Please clap. Yeah, please, please clap. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm really upset that more people didn't make Jeb please clap references to that whole video because that was the ideal joke for me. It was like yeah. this is the perfect context. Well, for that what joke. else? What what where else would Jeb be giving a speech? You know, for his 2020 <laughs> campaign other than the DSA caucus. Yeah. Right. And of course, <laughs> the Jeb 2020. No caucus. one claps because yeah. they you know that could you know give somebody anxiety or you know any number of reasons. And I'm not I, I'm not trying to talk on people with with anxiety uh, brought on by clapping but uh jeb would absolutely be on stage saying please let them clap to the organizers there so you know anyway <laughs> getting back to the topic well um, I, yeah like in today's yeah. identity politics kind of world like this is an extremely relevant question i think that how we identify is something so important to our legitimacy as human beings when we enter into a struggle against some kind of like a global force that's trying to you know exploit us yeah, take take away our freedoms the whole planet. like basically yeah. like yeah octopus arm everybody um you know <laughs> that's to describe it well um, actually just really, and spiders come to mind yeah well actually just really quick i feel it is really Octopi. relevant to make this right. uh reference that you know matt taibbi once described the stretch of financial capital like through goldman sachs as a a gigantic squid shoving its blood funnel into any orifice that will generate profit mm. one of the most mm. <laughs> powerful descriptions of the modern instantiation yeah. of capital yeah. that eat I've your ever heart heard. out tentacle porn yeah there you go uh, you thought you had it cornered but that market it was well long before yeah long Ant before anti capitalist already... we're coming we're coming for that <laughs> coming for that hentai market we're coming for that hentai money bro yeah <laughs> about to make this brood about to eat that wheat get that hentai money <laughs> yeah so <laughs> oh, shit, i already love this episode <laughs> this, is, this is this is how we started it is uh real philosophy hours right that's right now. let's hit on something and i think this will actually set us up to start digging through the content of the book and you brought up the idea of interpolation the really powerful, important idea from Louis Althusser about how identity is formed in an ideological context. My way of thinking about interpolation, in case no one has ever heard that word, is it references this idea of what would be called a hailing, or basically someone sort of singling you out, pointing to you and saying, hey, you, and the fact that you're described and ascribed a particular identity and subjective position in a sort of way is a sort of core generative moment in which you identify yourself and understand yourself as an individual person existing in the world through these kind of ideological larger structures and contexts that you're in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you're standing in a big crowd out in the distance. Somebody says like, hey, asshole, you know, and you like immediately turn around. <laughs> it's obviously yeah. the most relevant way to, to think about this. Yeah. I, that happened to me all the time. Yeah. And so it's, you know, it's like uh, <laughs> not what you're called, but it's what you respond to yeah. or something like yeah, along yeah, those lines. And so it, yeah. he used uses this idea of interpolation to describe like how we are brought into uh, our being as subjects, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it's it's um, 
it's very relevant, obviously, for this question. And I'm sure it was pretty influential to the way that uh, Alain Badu looks at yeah. subjectivity as well. So, Well, let's think about a very particular kind of interpolation, a very particular identity that I think is very prominent, especially in the more radical left. And it is the idea of being a militant. Right. Ooh, that's a that's a spiky one, right? All right. There. Well, this militant, is militant, huh? This is this is how we're starting the book. So let let's think about this. So I have really that the sort of core generative starting question because the book is made up of like three or four very short kind of sections and one sort of very long essay. I think of it, but the first section and the first essay is really about this idea of philosophy's relation to politics, particularly through the lens of what is militancy and how does that relate. If our core starting question is what does it mean to be quote unquote militant politically, how do we actually use this word on the left? So I want to start with a quote from Bruno Bastilles, who is another uh, leftist political thinker and writer who uh, introduces the book. But he has this interesting idea where he says, perhaps equally important is the popular etymology that links the old Latin, uh, miles, my Latin is shit, uh, miles <laughs> to, but basically saying it's a bunch of Latin words. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read that. But the, the core sort of etymology <laughs> of militant. On you stay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> damn, Sorry. your Latin's way better than mine. Um, you should read this quote. Uh, but basically the idea, the, the the core sort of root of the word militant is actually related to mile goers in Latin. And he basically says that we could thus say that a militant, simply put, is somebody who not only talks the talk, but also walks the walk or who goes the full mile. So I was curious, oh, okay. like what you make of that as an idea of what exactly it does mean to be militant, especially in relation to politics. And I don't know, any other thoughts or, or connotations you have for whenever you think of the word militant? Man. So like in my head, I take it pretty seriously. I mean, obviously in today's world, you know, not that of whatever ancient Rome. <laughs> Wait, am I, am I an idiot? Do they speak Latin in ancient Rome? Yeah, no, that's what okay, they Okay, okay. Yeah, I just had a yeah, brain fart there thing. for a second. I was like, wait a second. It was, uh, it was uh, pig Latin? Pig, yeah, they were actually mm -hmm. speaking yeah. uh, in pig Latin, the Latin of the Pope. And, uh, and that is and historically the accurate. You can check. <laughs> uh, okay, so. No, no, but so. It sounded like Stefan Molnir right there. That's a Molnir <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Molly, Molly News name's been dropped. Yeah. Oh shit! Blacklist, blacklist. Yep. Um, I mean, you will be you, you will be blacklisted if you at uh, Molly New in in this by that. That's 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 oh, yeah, serious. Actually, yeah, we are watching all of yeah, you. Yeah, we're, we're watching every <laughs> single one of you. We know who you are, and if you <laughs> your at subscription will be Molly New, I will fight you. You're black. You're black. You're off. You're done. Canceled. You know, listen, uh, there are I heard that canceled was canceled. Is canceled canceled? I think we're trying to get beyond canceling now. Okay. I know there is. I can't remember her last name, but she's pretty prominent on Twitter. She's a leftist. She basically said we should just cancel everybody and start over. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's what um, I'm just waiting for Yellowstone. Or what is it? Yosemite? Whichever one's going to erupt. Yeah, that's, that's, we just, re hard reset. That's we're going to cancel we're, the planet. That's, <laughs> cancel, cancel planet. Yeah, the planet's canceled. <laughs> it's not Captain Planet, it's Cancel Planet. Whoa. <laughs> anyway, uh, so here on Cancel Planet Podcast, uh, we, Man, we're, we're, we're going to have to have like a patron, a, a patron series that's going to be called Canceled Planet. Okay, yeah. so like basically, when I encounter leftists it's very rare that i talk to anybody who describes himself in that way as like a militant mm. right um but i think that uh, not to reveal anything about you and i's involvement with the left but like militancy is something that i think we take very seriously and like yeah, i don't absolutely. you know like you don't you don't just go into something and call yourself a militant in a like a willy-nilly kind of way that's kind of like yeah i don't know that's that's just like uh, virtue signaling and just flexing for no reason to get yourself involved in something that is like probably good and you know decent in nature and then to just kind of like not really give a fuck would be fucked up like you know people people who are militants are supposedly the the real ones yeah right? it's like they're the like the rider ones. dies yeah and so <laughs> <laughs> and so like that's exactly what it means <laughs> yeah yeah you know like who's who's riding shotgun with you yeah. when you go fucking rob the bank like the militants right uh the, the those are the militants and so like i don't i don't encounter people like that often that describe themselves in that way but when i do I feel like the fucking dos Equis guy but when i do oh boy oh boy am i in for it like i don't know I, I don't even know how to describe other than to just be like my god you take this so it's like ban heavy fucking 
whack jobs. Like I don't I don't know. I can't I don't know how to really it's not they're not militant in the sense that they're just like out there doing the shit and getting it done every day and making it a part of their yeah. lives and like really having the experience to talk from the perspective that they have from all the things they've gotten accomplished. They're militants in the sense that they just wanna like have this super hardcore regimented top down kind of hierarchical structure where they like boss people around and they treat them as though they don't know who the fuck they're talking about or what the fuck they're talking about and yeah. w- wanna have the dominance and the hierarchy of militants militancy but don't actually have any real necessarily credentials to justify having that kind of organization to yeah what they're what they're endeavoring to do so. yeah and i also think i mean you hit on a really important point which is that there's this relationship between being militant and also functioning as if you're operating in a military type structure it's very similar it's this idea that it connotes a certain kind of structure it connotes a certain kind of seriousness that whenever i think back to like who have the militants been groups that come to mind community policing from the black panther groups at various oh, yeah. times um, you know, groups who have engaged in armed struggle yeah. uh, for revolutionary causes all across the world. I mean, I have this idea of a. Of there, a very... there is no other struggle. There's only the armed struggle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I um, mean, there are, there are other struggles. Don't get me wrong, but like like you crying into your cereal in the morning is not the uh, the struggle we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, very different kind of struggle. <laughs> uh, but I do think it's important that how in our particular context of the stage of capitalism, where we're in, especially in a place like the U.S., how the way that identity is this commodity. It's this thing that we now adopt and utilize in this way that is giving us a sort of coherence to something that is, in my Lacanian sort of way of thinking about it, at its core, deeply incoherent and traumatic and fractured. <laughs> oh, and, yes. Yeah. And so the way is, is that I think there's a way that militancy becomes another kind of commodified identity that we can then adopt. And it gives us a certain coherence for our for other people to sort of virtue signal in a way, but it also gives us a sense of coherence and meaning and structure precisely in a world where we might find that very difficult or our prior way that we're interpolated in our identities, we're trying to exit that in some way. And, you know, maybe for very good reason, we're very critical and, and, you know, have been very even sometimes violently imposed upon by those ideological structures and militancy becomes a way to resist that in a very loud and visible fashion to me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. No, oh, okay. <laughs> Anything else? Was, uh, we just think, move uh, on? I think you summed it up there. Okay. Was, uh, <laughs> well, so let, let's <laughs> let's <sorry>. maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I no, like, that's good. <laughs> I mean, I, let's use that to set up kind of the next question. We were kind of framing this as you know we read things like Zizek and Badiou and find them important because they help us ask particular types of questions or think about things through the lens of philosophy and theory in a way that ideally would shed a certain kind of light on the political problems that we're facing now. If I had to encapsulate at least the first section of this book, I think really what Badiou is trying to describe is what, are the, what is the relationship between politics and philosophy, which is a very, very thorny question. So maybe before we, we move on, I feel like this is something you might have thought about once or twice in your life. What do you think is the relationship between politics and philosophy? <laughs> Ooh, deep question. Okay, so it's difficult. To, I mean, it's weird because I'm probably going to draw upon uh, ideas that Badiou would probably talk about directly. Because yeah, I mean, sure. honestly, like mm-hmm. a lot of my knowledge about this is informed through Zizek and you know Badiou as like somebody he comments on a lot. So yeah. honestly, I'd probably say it's something along the lines of like your sort of subjective engagement with something that is serious and involves the sort of like lives and endeavors of like all the people around you, including yourself, not just because it is something that you feel guilty about or you feel inclined to doing out of some kind of like feeling of obligation, but because something sparks you or 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 sort of motivates you into doing it because it's right or because mm-hmm. like in some way it becomes elevated to like one of those goals that's undeniable and becomes so relevant or pertinent to you that you have to engage with it as deeply as you can afford to in your own life and what that ends up superseding what that ends up changing about your circumstances become irrelevant a lot of the things in your life that you relate to start to be things you relate to only in and through <laughs> the the engagement that you have with politics and yeah, i think sure. that and i don't mean that like there has to be some like deep passionate motivation for you to engage with politics i think that like there are ways in which you can incorporate important work 
in politics into your day-to-day lives and it can just become mechanized and it's something that you just should engage with out of responsibility or like out of you know care for how things turn out in the world i don't know fucking recycle but like no that's all you gotta do just recycle you know uh just put things in the right bins i think that the thing that gets people interested in questions like militancy mm-hmm. and and when that's appropriate or like what can be done about really really serious problems facing you know, our, our nation or just populations globally, like displaced peoples, the thing that, that sparks people's interest into those domains and considering what it is that defines their engagement with politics usually happens because of some, here we go, is the keyword event. Um, <laughs> with a capital E. <laughs> with event. a ca- event. Um, and so, <laughs> so, yeah, and I mean, I'm not, this is just me trying to like encapsulate for myself what I would imagine a discussion about the connection between politics and philosophy would consist of. And I think that for, for your average lay person, it's just a result of like some event that, that sparks them into like mm-hmm. caring yeah. and, and feeling responsible to do something. I think for people like you and I, it's a little different because like, Obviously, we care enough to like try to power through these like, ridiculous volumes of philosophy yeah. looking for the Why answers the of like, what this? the fuck yeah. are we supposed to do? But like, you know, I think that probably generally speaking, a lot of people don't necessarily want to power through a giant volume of like somebody trying to explain to them how they should engage. Yeah. I think a lot of people are just like, just give me the thing I need to do and I'll go do it. And, you know, unfortunately, there might be some little things you have to, some little thorny things you might have to deal with before something like that actually, both A, is effective in any kind of way Mm -hmm. outside of just your own life world, and B, satisfies that feeling that you have inside of you to Mm -hmm. like, like that responsibility that you feel towards like something larger than yourself, you know, that's not going to satisfy that either. So, yeah, I think that's like really important. And that kind of does lead to something that I have in the notes that Bad You starts with, which is he references Vladimir Lenin's incredibly popular influential work that everyone (laughs) on the left reads, which is what is to be done. What is to be done? Yeah, and I think that just for anyone who hasn't read that work or has familiarity with this particular phase of Lenin's political thought, the idea is that essentially there are the masses over there and there's the revolutionary vanguard who needs to basically take theory to the masses to help show them how to coalesce their general concerns into a sharpened political project. And so the people who are usually in this vanguard who brings this to the masses are intellectuals, philosophers, these types of folks. And he has this interesting reference to, you know, during the the May 68 protests, there were these calls on the barricades of saying, like, what is the plan? What are the orders? And so this relationship between some sort of vanguard who brings in some understanding from the outside to help again, sharpen a a set of mass grievances or protests into a very clear political project, I think is, as well as I do, is one that we wrestle with all the time. It it is such a complex and, and, you know, really conflictual history of how to understand this. In terms of whenever I think about also really important things about the relationship between philosophy and politics, a couple thousand years ago in ancient Greece, where a lot of at least the the origins of Western uh, European philosophy started, Mm -hmm. the, the first major works of philosophy, the you know, the works of Plato were profoundly political. The Republic is, was in fact a political text. Yeah. And Aristotle's explorations of different constitutions of the Greek states. To me, it's also something that, you know, very far back in the past, at the origins of the kind of philosophy that Badiou and, you know, even Zizek are doing, politics and philosophy were never separate. They were always one unified sort of project that philosophical exploration always had implications for the way that society is structured, the way that institutions work, what is the meaning of government, what is the different type of government we should operate on based on the population and what we want to get out of that. So to me, it's also important to remember that, that, you know, if you're interested in politics, at some point in the past, philosophy was a sort of a prerequisite to even thinking about politics in the first place. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I think what I was going to say is like, maybe like, if you believe in causality (laughs) being a thing, then of course you would interpret philosophy as a domain that would have to do with with politics. I mean, politics is that domain that affects like everyone all at once, kind of. Yeah, absolutely. And so... 
philosophy being something that should be universalizable in some sense or another obviously should come into play because it's like the background against which we are able to make decisions about those kinds of like large scale maneuvers in political Mm -hmm. or in politics that ultimately lead to changes in like your everyday life and the everyday lives around of the people around you so like please make no mistake that we're not talking about philosophy for like when you're bored in the airport and you want to know what like the dalai lama thinks about like that uh, shit is garbage yeah that's that's trash or like uh um, Jordan Peterson's like telling you to clean your mom's room or some shit like that. No, no one, no one. That's clean not daddy's room. Who's, yeah. Clean, clean daddy Peterson's room. At the end of the day, you know, there's a certain kind of philosophy that is just like weird placating wisdoms about like how life functions. Almost and, like, like pop philosophy. Yeah. Shit. You know, and that stuff is, is all great. And that's what kind of why I wanted to Im- invoke that like eventual yeah. domain in, in Badu, because I think that. For people like us who are like uh, probably seeking answers in philosophy to like real political problems that we're seeing the the world face right now yeah. and kind of wanting to involve ourselves more deeply or in a more impactful way, like, you know, we're not... I we're, think we're, we're not reading the pop philosophy books. This is like now yeah. if, if you're listening to this, trying to learn about bad you, you're definitely in it for, for, you know, and so I, I feel us. like a lot of the, one yeah, of one us. of us, <laughs> one. And so I feel like those people, you guys, y'all are the ones that are looking for specifically answers to a problem, ways of going about engaging with a problem. Yeah, um, which is, I think, so. what philosophy has always been about. And, I mean, since I, I mentioned uh, Big Daddy Aristotle a second ago, <laughs> I mean, it's important just to reference that his conception of what it meant to be human was to be a political animal, as he called mm. called us. Yeah. Yes. So it's getting the eyebrows going yeah, up and down yeah, a little yeah, bit right there. Right? Eyebrows yeah, are just yeah. bing, 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 yep. bing, 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 No, they weren't bing, 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 Air horn eyebrows for <laughs> oh, the win. Well, let's keep uh, let's keep moving through the old bad you here. So I wanted to touch on, I think, a really interesting point that he starts near the beginning of the essay, which is thinking about Althusser, but also the birth of Marxism is stemming from two revolutionary advancements. So he basically says that Marx discovers a science of history, which is one of Althusser's old points. So that was essentially what Capital was really doing and, and all of Marx and Engels' work was it's this discovery of a particular science of historical development. So it's interesting way he's going to set this up, and this is very Hegelian, I think, too, is that there are these scientific discoveries that happen. And then there's going to be a sort of corresponding philosophical development that's going to take the implications of that scientific development and sort of extend it into the realm of philosophy. For Marx's discovery of the science of history, he sees the corresponding philosophical development as being dialectical materialism. So which I thought was a pretty interesting sort of way to describe this. Um, <laughs> but I know that, you know, you you are... It's a strange, yeah, it's a strange beast there. Dialectical yeah. materialism, huh? I wanted to sort of pick your brain about this too because he cites some other examples of when this has happened and he basically talks about Plato's philosophy being a a sort of corresponding growth from the developments of mathematics and that Kantian philosophy was a particular corresponding development to Newtonian physics Hmm. you know I think it sounds good on the surface but I'm also like you know he's plowing through this and just throwing this stuff out in this very short essay I do know that Badiou has a reputation even though he talks a lot about mathematics that a lot of mathematicians <clears throat> just think it's a bunch of complete gobbledygook. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much we should trust this uh, reference to philosophical developments from scientific uh, major, you know, sort of paradigm shifting discoveries as well. Uh, yeah, like maybe uh, some of the conclusions that Plato was talking about, you know, had to do with the P- Pythagoreans and, you know, just like sort of these mathematical fundamental principles that were being, you know, discussed and, you know, debated about in his time. And physics was definitely a new, interesting subject that I'm sure Kant would have had to engage with and, mm-hmm. you know, would have yeah. been thinking about and the re- its relevance and stuff. But I mean, like, where were the philosophical uh, developments as a result of Darwin's theory of, you know, the origin of species and yeah, or, or like, you know, the development. Uh, well, I, I mean, I guess there's plenty of these theories, right? I mean, I'm, I'm being a little naive myself, but like Bernays and like the revolution in advertising and like how, how did that affect the population? And what are we dealing with now in terms of like how people identify and what they desire? And it's like a complete shift in like that's, what was going on in, in culture. You know? That's and, an interesting one to bring up, too, because for anyone who doesn't know, Edward Bernays, the founder of Modern Public Relations, uh, propagandist, his uncle was old Siggy Freud. Yep. And 
And now we look at Sigmund Freud and be like, well, that shit ain't science. Yeah, talk about weaponizing an idea, right? Like yeah. this guy took Freud to just a whole nother level. Now it's just like under your skin and you don't even know. Yeah, and for anyone know. who hasn't seen or heard of Adam Curtis's documentary Century of the Self, it Ooh, tracks this development. One. And I will post a link in the show notes because everyone should definitely check that out. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Adam Curtis. That yeah. guy's fucking... Holla. You. Holla. I was going to do an Adam Curtis impression. Mm. Yeah, I know. Little uh, Italian. <laughs> <one>. <laughs> 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 we're both mwah. Mwah. We're mwah. That's where we're at. Late night philosophy hours. Yeah, on Red real, real philosophy hours. Let me hit you with that bad you knowledge. So here's a quote about this particular uh, relationship between philosophy and scientific discovery. He says, we can begin by considering the fact that this future does not depend principally on philosophy and on its history, but on new facts in certain domains, which are not immediately philosophical in nature. In particular, it depends on facts that belong to the domain of science. For example, mathematics for Plato. Descartes or Leibniz, all old school philosophy bros, if you aren't aware of them. Physics for Kant, Alfred North Whitehead or Karl Popper. History for Hegel or Marx. Biology for Nietzsche, Bergson or Deleuze. Yeah, fair enough. And I mean, I can't lie, you know, like I'm a fan of Zizek and if I'll be damned if he doesn't invoke quantum physics, like every goddamn book and lecture, like it's, it's That's true. you know pervasive so i mean it's definitely a thing also i think it's interesting that bad does name drop deleuze here because one of the things that isn't immediately apparent whenever you read deleuze unless you have this background already is his philosophy was really inspired by thermodynamics and it did mm. have a profound impact on the way that he conceived certain problems and you know i mean i think say what you will about bad i mean i'm not necessarily sure i would kick in his lecture door and start screaming maoist slogans at him but, you know, I mean, he's got some interesting shit there. He's worth checking out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, don't, yeah, don't get us wrong. Like, I'm I, I'm definitely not trying to knock anybody who thinks that philosophy comes as a result of, like, you know, the advances in yeah. material sciences. I actually think that that's absolutely what's happening. It's, it's uh, just in some ways we're a little behind the curve. And so it's difficult to develop a theory that's relevant to the development of history when we are the development of history. And that you know, it's kind of like you can't stand on your, yeah, you can't, you can't like stand on your own shoulders and look back at what you know was going to lead to you. That's uh, some true detective a, yeah, shit right I mean, there. You know, maybe if you you know do Time enough psychedelic drugs, yeah. <laughs> Time is a flat circle. Yeah. Yes. Why should I live in history, huh? I don't want to know anything anymore. This is a world where nothing is solved. Well, someone once told me time is a flat circle. If everything we've ever done or will do, we're going to do over and over and over again. Yes, you're already dead. Yeah, that's uh, right. You were never born. Uh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know. That, I don't know about that one. That's some Buddha shit. Um, you're like just trying no to get back feet. to the womb. Oh, that's yeah. It. Yeah, well, then, just now, climb back in. Well, now we're back in get, Freud, get so all Get all cozy and snuggle up. You ever heard of Otto Rank? No. So Otto Rank, very obscure psychoanalytic thinker. His whole uh, basis of his theory was that the primary trauma was the fact that we were just birthed at all ah. and everything that we're dealing everything with. Everything we do is a response to yeah. that tra traumatizing yeah. experience. So there you go. Hmm. Anyway, I have this book on my, my bookshelf in my uh, in my office where I do therapy. It's sort of a weird <laughs> thing to just sort of see out of the corner. Well, of my but you've eyes heard you've heard of those like the old those things that they used to do back in the past, right? When this stuff was all like hot and new, and they would do like uh, rebirthing therapy. Yeah, and people like, died because yeah, of that. that uh, fucking there's a there's a girl who died. In fact, I'm like a nerd. Uh, like online, there's like a it's called Pets Cop, and this is like old now, but like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just dropping in shout out to pets cop. No, I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> no one knows cop. about this shit, but like, yeah, it was just like one of those weird online mysteries and it, it totally in, invoked like the name of some girl who had died as a result of one of those like, uh, rebirthing type therapies where they try to like simulate the birthing experience for like an adult person or yep. like a mm -hmm. child and give yep. you a new name when you come out of it. And like, yeah, try to like overcome your trauma by like hitting a hard reset on you or something like, yeah, know, it was like they weird. would have these, this like space that you were supposed to crawl through and it's supposed to be like the birth canal. And it was incredibly tight, uh, sort of just a lot of pressure on. And so as you would crawl through it, Apparently, this young girl like suffocated and died while she was yeah. in the middle of the experience. That changed a lot of the way that we think about the scientific 
backing that we need for therapeutic <laughs> interventions now. Surprise, surprise. Because yeah. they based that on yeah. really just some, they were probably really high and they were just being like, oh yeah, man, if we could just be rebirthed. I feel like it's kind of like, you know, like when you have people that like reduce major philosophers to just like having misread someone. Sartre, like, oh, you just misread Hegel, fucking idiot. You know, and like, Heidegger, like, and yeah. Heidegger. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like the equivalent of that. I guess my whole explanation for like rebirthing therapy is like you guys just misread Freud. Like you just completely misunderstood and thought that this is what he meant, and is you're just the, so the wrong. Realm of the, like those the stupid symbolic into the stu- material. Yeah. yeah, like those stupid posters you see them everywhere now. It's just like a like pervasive metaphor that there's like the little tip of the iceberg sticking out at the top, and then the giant iceberg, rest of the iceberg <laughs> under the ocean, and then I like love that meme. <laughs> I like that meme. I like it as a meme, but like as a summary of like Freud's theories, it's like completely the no basis whatsoever. Like not even related. Well, it's like, the same thing whenever we talk about quantum mechanics, and it's like oh. Yeah, well, the the real conclusion of quantum mechanics is just set an intention, and you can have a yellow Corvette. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, like our world is completely indeterminate and meaningless. Yeah. So just uh, just uh, manifest it. everything that you want. It's perfect. It See, works. This you know? is exactly why. Tried and true. <laughs> like we got to combat this anti intellectualism and just get people to remember, as Gramsci said, that we're all philosophers because we got to get a lot more critical about this shit. <laughs> yes, criticism is important. It's very good. We're pro criticism on <laughs> pro criticism, but yeah, ultimately you can't just uh, magic it. So, in conclusion, today for philosophy for militants, <laughs> you can't just magic it. Yeah, you gotta actually stop reading the secret. Start reading philosophy for militants. <laughs> that's my message. All right, let's talk more health. Yeah, no, that's yeah. I th- I think it's really interesting that whenever we think about bed, you drawing on Althusser here and Althusser seeing, you know, Marx says discovering the science of history. But you has this, this sort of interesting note where he says that Althusser strangely returned to this perennial idea of philosophy, that philosophy is sort of the same, it never changes, it's always similar no matter what context you find it in, that it is always the same due to its dependency on science and has no real history, so to speak. So I found that kind of interesting that at least in Althusser's way of describing philosophy and its relationship to politics and science, that it doesn't have a history because it's this perennial idea or like method or you know certain approach that just never changes throughout time and i i wouldn't have thought of althusser that way but i think it's a sort of an interesting piece of shade that he's throwing at his uh, his old mentor there yeah and like in, in some sense i'm also like oh, but isn't that is that kind of is i don't know there's there's a degree to which i'm like yeah it's like a delayed mirror mm-hmm. you know sure. and like you wouldn't say that the mirror has like a like a history to it other than it's just always been there and it's always been sort of like trying to repeat in a mm-hmm. sort of delayed and like dim foggy way what it what what had just happened or had just occurred sure. but like you couldn't necessarily say that there was like a cohesion to the direction or to like the way that 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 philosophy developed but i mean i think that that's actually not true <laughs> you absolutely yeah. can look at it and you can say well like this is what it's been over time like the same way you can look at you know, the histories that it had come in response to. Yeah. So, I mean. Well, and I think maybe the whole reason why Badiou is spending, you know, this relatively short essay to focus on this is because if we're going to relate politics to philosophy, we got to first understand what is the nature of philosophy that we're trying to describe here. He has this interesting thing where he says that there tend to be two tendencies in the debate about the nature of philosophy. So these are a little dense, so I'm going to kind of read through these and maybe we can talk about them. So one he sees as a reflexive mode of knowledge about truth in the theoretical domain and values in the practical domain. So basically saying that the form of this school is that it mainly happens through reason debate, uh, discussion on questions focused on truth, kind of references people like Hegel, Kant, uh, Greek philosophers, that they typically see philosophy as being of this nature, this sort of fairly objective, dispassionate discussion about truth in a capital T sense. He also relates this to the discourse of the university from Lacan, which is this idea that truth and and sort of authority come from this sort of scientific objective mode that isn't actually claiming a subjective position, but is basically saying that this is this sort of dispassionate, objective, scientific process that we're engaging in, and that's what leads to our definition of truth and sort of how power and authority function. Hmm. Sorry, I just I have my internal critique alarms are going off. Okay, but, fair uh, enough. <laughs> so yes. this is why I thought this would be good. So, okay, so let's say that's one school. That's one one tendency in the debate about the nature of philosophy. And it doesn't seem that Badiou is really saying that's what he thinks it is at this point. He's saying this is one tendency. Now, the other tendency is he says it is a form of direct revolutionary change of the subject themselves. 
and it takes the form of a of a conversion, a kind of almost like religious conversion. I, I get the sense of. He says it is a complete upheaval of the existence. Uh, similar to a religious function. And in this particular tendency, philosophy is not knowledge so much, but is an act. And he talks about Socrates corrupting the youth. And for anyone Mm -hmm. that doesn't remember their philosophy 101 course, essentially Socrates was known for going around the market and basically just like ruthlessly trolling people and getting people to question the most basic assumptions about what is truth, what is justice, and eventually, you know, maybe not super smart, but decided to drink some hemlock and commit suicide versus having to be uh, sort of excommunicated (laughs) from the city because he was uh, ruthlessly put on trial for this tendency that he had. Interestingly enough, Badu sees this as the discourse of the master as opposed to the discourse of the university. And this is a short quote. He says, In this tendency, it is an affair of personal commitment in which the combative affirmation comes first, above all against the sophists and against the doubts of the sages who honor the university. So let's let's kind of step back because there is a lot going on. Yeah, there's on a lot there. to unpack there. So what do you make of these two different tendencies, this discourse of the university and objective truth-seeking and this sort of revolutionary change of subject, this almost conversion process? That's the discourse of the master. I think that the discourse of the university is like a very appealing and very, I guess you could say, easy way of falling into discussions about whether it be revolutionary politics or just politics in general. Yeah, sure. It's easy, uh, much easier to like actually try to come up with new ideas that have to do, new informed ideas, at least I guess, that have to do with like the contemporary goings on than it is to just open up a book and say like, look here, in yeah. this book on, you know, chapter seven, you know, page 42, whatever. I guess I hope it wouldn't be page 42 if it was chapter seven. But like, whatever, like this is the instructional guide, yeah. what we're supposed sure. to do, right? Like there's no guarantee for the revolution. There's not going to be somewhere that will vouchsafe your success. And so I think that the university discourse is kind of the go-to for most people about most things. You I know? think it's also the way that philosophy is generally taught and understood. Absolutely, yeah. There is there is an academic standard for what you're supposed to know about philosophy, and it includes like certain big names. Yeah. All of the rest of it, all of the other things that came as a result, the spandrels, so to speak, yeah, sure. of like all of those kinds of ideas and like what they led to are unimportant as long as you know the foundations, you know, and you'll get through your course and you'll make an A if you have like D these amounts of knowledge about these philosophers, right? Yeah, like, it's almost like can you regurgitate and, and adequately describe right. to the, the best of our understanding or like whatever our criteria are, like, oh, what was Descartes' positions? Yeah. What were Kant's main Welcome to education in the 21st century, right? This is what, this is how we are. This is what we do. This is how we learn everything else in our lives. Like if I need to fix something in my car that's approachable, well, I'll just like watch a YouTube tutorial and it'll teach me how to do it. And then that's all I need to know about that and how it fits into the world. And then it's done and it's out of the way. Yeah, I think what's really relevant here, too, is that the episode we just did on pedagogy of the oppressed uh, with comrade slash professor Noah DeLissavoy. Oh, I have not heard that one yet. Oh, yeah, it's going to be good. This is essentially what what Freire describes as the banking model of education, that the role of education is essentially to take the ideas and just deposit them into the minds (laughs) of the students. Uh, All the answers are there. Uh, The path is laid out. The criteria is clear and you just need to meet that criteria. But the idea that you would actively engage in a process of philosophical discovery and thinking on your own, that is not what education is about. No, absolutely not. And that's always been my my gripe, right? Educa- I mean, we're not, I know we're not talking about education right now, but like, I think that that's... I mean, it's a political education hugely, podcast. Well, I guess we are then. Shit. Yeah. I will say. Yeah, self-crit right now. <laughs> self-crit right now. Uh, damn. Um, no, but like, just in general, you know, like it, it, makes, my, it makes my butt clench. Um, the, uh, <laughs> self-crit. Yeah. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the only thing, we have it backwards. Like the only thing that people should be being taught is like how to use those, like how to employ those like critical faculties and those like intellectual critical faculties that you have that like allow you to like reason bullshit from, you know, relevancy and like employ those things in all domains, right? And then secondary to that should be like maybe like some kind of mastery of like all of the domains yeah and sure. like some of the some of the re- most relevant information within those domains but yeah, like the most there, important there a thing for that right, right the most elementary thing would be for you to be able to like employ your critical faculties and like i don't think that that's like ever taught to anyone no in an explicit way even in some of the you know it's like luckily for me like there's been some you know philosophy professors and stuff along the way that have like you know woken me up to this you know made me see the light of day about the- 
those. But like, you which know, which I think is what always good teachers do. Whenever people right. think back to, oh, I had those one or two really great teachers in my life. More often than not, that's what they were doing. I just, I, I think the university discourse idea uh, about philosophy is like, it's easy. I guess we'll just yeah. put it that way. It right? also seems to be the way that people are exposed to philosophy and then come to hate it and think it is completely irrelevant for their lives. Yeah. Absolutely. I've ne- I've met so many people. Every time you talk to somebody about having an interest in philosophy, you basically get the same response. It's like, oh, yeah, philosophy. That was a cool class that yeah. I took once. Jeez. To be or not to be, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah, man. You know, the world's deep, man. Like, yeah. yeah. World is just a stage. That's my philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't do anything but serve myself. What about you? Yeah. Um, that's not a philosophy at all. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I think I think a, a perspective that obviously you have to engage with with the university discourse on philosophy because there's no other authoritative way to learn philosophy. Yeah, I mean, that's there's, right. It's kind of like what you're forced to do if you yeah. want to actually really learn it in depth. Yeah, unless you're like a, whatever, a trust fund kid like Kant or whatever, like, where you just like have an enormous library in a state and you're just going to like study all day until you figure it all out and then write a huge volume about it. Yeah. That just, it doesn't seem likely to happen in the contemporary life world that I'm a part of. I don't know about you, but... No, it doesn't um, seem to reflect my life at all. Yeah, I don't think... <laughs> It doesn't doesn't seem to reflect mine either. Well, I mean, I do I do read a lot of volumes and I do you know think a lot about things, but you know. But I mean, but let's think about that though, you know, because the in some ways the fact that you and I both do that isn't necessarily a an expression of you know a life of incredible privilege and material resources. It's sort of like <laughs> it's the opposite. You, yeah, it's almost it's it's that it's actually spurred by the fact that we don't have that kind of situation, but you know, are also very passionately engaged in trying to answer real questions about real political problems that we experience in our lives that we're pushed to this stuff. Yeah. At the end of the day, the only practical way within which most people can engage deeply with philosophy is through the university discourse. So like when you have an issue or something, some conundrum that you can't overcome in your life and and you think philosophy is the answer, well, of course, you're going to refer to the universally accepted definitions of the whatever philosophers, you know, philosophy that that you, you can find. And that's going to be through the university discourse. And, but that's not the only thing, right? Like, yeah, there's yeah. A, there's a further step. If this is the one that we encounter most often, and it, it's sort of the dominant way of understanding what philosophy is for not just people in the academy, but most people in general, whenever they think about philosophy, what are your thoughts about this other tendency, which is philosophy as this sort of revelatory process that changes us as subjects at our core? I wish, you know, there's like a part of me that was like, <laughs> I was so Damn. waiting for you to be like, I love it. And it's like, ah, no, I wish no. it was that way. Yeah, no, I, w- I wish it was that way. It doesn't change you. Like, I mean, you can deeply, right? But like, is it going to um, answer everything for you? No, of course. What the fuck? That doesn't. Good just, philosophy always leads to more questions. Exactly, right? Like, good philosophers reframe the way that you question the world around you. They don't. They don't just give you the answers to the questions well, you already have. My, my anarchist snaps. <laughs> yes. Snaps. Anarchist, yes. Snaps. anarchist snaps. For that perspective, I almost feel like this is where like, the distinction between like Badiou and Zizek comes about in some sense because. Yeah. I think that one of the things inherent to the idea of event in the first place, you know, this sort of structuring gesture that happens in the world that sort of reorients you or sort of subjectivizes Mm -hmm. you in this like interpolation, Althusserian sense, toward your subjectivity as a revolutionary, as a militant, right? That sort of like necessitates this idea that, that there's a separation between the event and its context and like the subject that develops, right? And that like there's some way you can define the event that really changed people and yeah, sure. you know the difference between that event and like some just mundane happenings of the world right you know which and is so- a challenge in bad use philosophy because we're going to talk about specifically his conception of what an event is and yeah. why they lead to these sort of revelations which change us as subjects and as individuals and you know right and so stuff, it's so. almost like in some sense you know with regard to that if, if you're conceiving of it as something happened and it was like religious in nature or like whatever revelatory in nature and it yeah. changed your subjectivity into like now being more militant that's wonderful if it's never perceived by you I guess like my perspective is kind of like well, if, you, if it really just did, like whatever happened just changed your attitude and you just started behaving completely differently and dedicating yourself to like leftist politics and like really trying to make a change. That's great. 
then yeah, absolutely. Like from a removed perspective, looking at this, you could describe it that way. But like, unfortunately, this is a book that is aimed directly at the subjects that are asking this question yeah, of like, absolutely. how do yeah. you know, like what's going <laughs> to, what's my engagement with, you know, politics and philosophy is supposed sure. to be. And th- those people obviously haven't had this revelatory moment <laughs> that like just shifted them into the perfect, um, you know, soldiers for the left or whatever, you know. And so I'm sorry, uh, the sleeper, the sleeper cell moment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, your word is banana. You hear that? You're all now leftist Manchurian candidates. <laughs> <laughs> banana. <laughs> um, and I so- got those like, weird like, conspiracy theorists. Like, it's like a hand signal. It's like I reference one of like a Disney character, and then I give you a hand signal, and that activates you into a leftist militant. <laughs> If only it was that easy. Yeah. <laughs> Lion King. <laughs> dialectic and I'm doing hands. The dialectic. <laughs> dialectic hands. <laughs> Look at that right there, right on the same wavelength. Bam. Get out of my head. Well, let's Even uh you're already sleeping in my head. <laughs> let's leave this particular sort of description of these two different tendencies with a final point on Althus Air. And then I actually want to come to this way that we're talking about philosophy at its core, reframing the way that you ask questions or what you sort of think are the questions to ask. Because I think that's going to be sort of the core of Badiou's whole point in this first essay. So I have this this thing here. And again, you know, Badiou, as a student of Althusser, you know, it is interesting to think that Althusser actually saw philosophy, you know, a very philosophical thinker, as the political struggle in the realm of theory. So whenever we encounter these sort of theoretical arguments that it, it isn't something separate from a political struggle. It's sort of where the political struggle is manifesting in the realm of theory itself. Uh, so he saw that materialism is the revolutionary framework for theory, while idealism is the conservative framework. So that's the distinction he oh. makes there. Okay, yeah, wait, wait, wait. Let me get that straight. Yeah. The revolutionary theory is materialism. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the conservative theory is idealism. Yes, that would be true to Althusser's conceptualization, sure. as bad you described it. Sure. Okay. Okay. Sure. Really, at the end of the day, and I think this is where he's going to really draw on Althusser for, for bad you's own approach, he actually saw that philosophy introduces divisions among opinions about scientific knowledge. So in some ways, the whole role of philosophy for Althusser was to sort of create these divisions, these moments where it sort of cleaves how we interpret scientific knowledge in one way or the other. And that's sort of the realm of philosophy is to sort of stake those positions out. It's interesting that he would say that, that it kind of cleaves, you know, those things apart, because in a sense, like the cleaving happens in both domains as well, right? Like you can't have revolutionary ideas or materialist ideas without without idealizing them, right? And you also can't have the idealism without its like sort of it's like material praxis, right? And so it's almost I, as if they need to be dialectically related to each oh, other. Wait, wait, there's that word again. Word of the day. Word of the day. Real philosophy hours on Red Library. <laughs> I think. Oh, here comes. The, oh, yeah. Here comes the birthday cake. Here it goes. You said it. Dialectic. There is a relationship between those things. Is it like cut and dry, half and half? Hmm. I, we shall see. We shall see. Okay, so let's let's keep uh, moving along the old country road here. Damn, did I just? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take my wolf Thank to you. The road. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally gonna paste that in, and we're probably gonna get sued it's for copyright a, ooh, yeah, so. shit. I'm gonna take my uh, change, change the you to the old. Um, yeah, I don't know. Fucking May '68. <laughs> That's the remix. Remix. All right. So let's talk about how Badiou takes this sort of influence from his mentor, Althusser, and really states out his own kind of position about the role of philosophy. So for Badiou, he has two general remarks on what he sees as the sort of role of philosophy in relation to politics. He says, philosophy always takes the form of a decision, a separation, a clear distinction of some kind. So these distinctions are, uh, for example, you know, philosophy states out the claim to a decision between good versus evil, wisdom versus ignorance, knowledge versus opinion, etc. So it's pretty obvious, though, that whenever you think about those, they're not equally weighted in terms of which one you can choose. Right. So the decision is always normative and it introduces a hierarchy. What's really interesting here is he says that this decision and hierarchy introduces a type of subjectivity. So to make the choice is in fact to occupy a particular subjective position or a way of understanding the world and yourself and the relationship between the two. He says it proposes values beyond the common ones and overturns established order. 
And he says that philosophy is seen as the creative repetition of the same. So let's maybe mm-hmm. unpack some of that real fast. So okay. what do you think of this idea that philosophy always takes a form of a decision between, you know, these two mutually exclusive choices? Well, I mean, I think traditionally, yeah, philosophy in a lot of ways tries to dichotomize a lot of issues along some, yeah, like along some axis. It's not necessarily a clear one yeah, to most sure. people. In fact, yeah. a lot of times it can just become way more diluted than you ever expected it to become. But like, yeah, I think traditionally there are... Uh, most questions that beg answers tend to go in that direction, right? Like the answer is either one thing or another, right? Like you have to narrow it down to, you know, even if you're talking about, I don't know, statistics or something like you, you want to be able to determine whether or not something happens as a result of chance or, or, or yeah, as sure. a result of your experimentation. Yeah, so like everything in some sense behaves in this way. Philosophy is no exception, right? Mm-hmm. Like sure. dichotomizing these domains of truth. Or dichotomizing things into being in the domain of truth or not. Yeah, well, I almost think back to, again, thinking about Aristotle, like one of the foundations of Greek now, like Western philosophy, which is that A is A, A is not B. And this yeah. way that the fundamental form of the, the syllogism and, and, you know, basic logic is that things are either one thing or they're the other. And I wonder if there's a way that that sort of also functions as this sort of foundational logical piece of this dichotomization process of it's like, yeah, okay, we're going to be choosing one thing or the other. And I can't help but think about the relationship between a really bastardized, really just stupid instantiation of Aristotelian logic and Ayn Rand fedora wearing libertarian gargoyles. <laughs> and how... <laughs> And how often I know exactly who you're talking about. Uh, yeah, we both do. Yeah. So but the way that the way that they sort of function in discourse and in conversation is always the people who show up and, you know, are the well actually I'm going to yep. use logic and scientific reason without, you know, realizing that in some ways there's always this uh, normative dimension to what they're saying. Like it's never just logic. It is always normative the way that that functions. And also it's just a really shitty understanding of of logic in itself yeah absolutely i mean come on like i mean i'm not i mean earlier when you were talking about sort of the the objectivization uh or like the objective sort of perspective on history right like the sort of science of history Mm -hmm. well it's like even in contemporary science today like you find this strange phenomena of data being collected for some purpose or another to try and make sense of some problem and then a whole book being written by a researcher about their sort of just pontificating about like what it might mean and then people reading those books like making the conclusions of an experiment into like a whole life philosophy of like well this is how the whole world works because i read a book by somebody who did quantum experiments yeah right or was involved in quantum research and he wrote a book just like whatever making up some shit that he tried in his hardest to like express it to like the lay person and like now i've just you know i i've figured out how the whole world works right like scientism i have and, to and tell it's you just like come on man like that's not you can't that's not how science works yeah right sure. like the data doesn't tell you anything conclusive about anything which has always been the thing (laughs) about those like weird new agey spiritualist conclusions about quantum mechanics is that nothing in the data leads you to make any of these fucking conclusions right this is pure like fantasy yeah this was designed specifically to answer one question and one question only which had to probably do with some obscure numbers and mathematics that like no one is going to be privy to other than like scientists conducting the experiment maybe some other researchers doing similar research no 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 it definitely tells you why you should drop eight thousand dollars on that yoga retreat in tulum mexico (laughs) and you know just proceed to be a shitty narcissistic asshole to everyone in your life that's definitely what those quantum mechanic experiments do yeah yeah you should get a you should get a man bun and you should go on a vision (laughs) quest yeah man just go do do uh take the sacred tea just go do ayahuasca yeah. that's exactly oh, what they yeah it's a great idea just go, go, to go Peru. into a completely foreign culture and experiment with like their most intense psychedelics and then just come back and tell everybody else how the fucking world works because facts and logic because fuck you yeah right yeah absolutely you know <laughs> you still got your beamer <laughs> you can still buy prostitutes you know you gotta yeah. wonder how many people who go on those things actually do own at least one beamer yeah did I derail right. you? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just, yeah, I don't know, man. Obviously, you and I have had many encounters with many, well, actuallys. And, <laughs> you know, I just feel like there is a degree to which absolutely science has weighed in on like so many philosophical, to the point where I think universities even view philosophy as like some kind of like fully expendable topic. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. Their budgets are being cut. 
ad, like philosophy professors can find no jobs, period, yeah, anywhere. Absolutely. Well, and, and it's like, you know, you guys realize, right, that like the development of science came as a result of like philosophy yeah. being done, right? Like yeah. it, it was something that was trying to formalize philosophy into a way of like inquiring about the world methodologically. And that's why we have modern science. The fact that people dismiss philosophy as being just like meaningless or useless or just i don't know any number of things it's kind of like no man like on, on some level it's more it's like just as foundational right like it should be taken just as seriously well i, I do wonder if there's a piece of this too that as matt swartheimer might say that we're seeing the university and education succumbing to the dominance of instrumental reason that anything that isn't pragmatic and cannot be used to generate more profit yep. in the realm of capital will essentially be dispensed with and is expendable yep but the ultimate philosophical knowledge is to know that everything just comes down to money and who's money and and where's the money and so it's kind of like yeah sure you can think about your philosophical things all day and you know blah blah, blah. kind of like uh jeffrey epstein treats the scientists when yeah, he takes right? them out to dinner that's right <laughs> you guys could talk about science all day but what's that got to do with pussy yeah uh, that is yeah. true that is, direct that is a direct quote just in case anyone yeah, yeah. has not seen that that is a direct quote from jeffrey epstein yeah so don't, don't be an Epstein. Don't okay? don't at us on Twitter <laughs> don't either. That us. is just us repeating what Epstein is quoted as having said. Don't don't be a philosophy Epstein. Yeah. Okay. Take philosophy seriously. It's not it's not expendable. It matters. But anyway, philosophy yeah, science matters, and logic. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, really, at the end of the day, that's the whole point of this this episode is to basically say, y'all, you need to fucking facts, facts read, and logic. Yeah, like real facts and logic, yeah. right? Not bullshit facts and logic. Well, we talked a little bit at various points about Badiou's conception of the event with a capital E. It's sort of a core feature, a core concept in his philosophy. I thought it might be a good point for us to kind of unpack a little bit about what that means and how he sees that relating to philosophy and politics and such. So again, this is this is going to be a really sort of quick and dirty description of this idea in Badiou, but he's written tomes of books with mathematical theory and platonic idealism and all this other shit that's just trying to explain this particular idea. But this is a very quick version of it. So for Badiou, he has this idea that they're in a very sort of unpredictable, almost like contingent way. There are these things called events with capital E's and they sort of bring about changes in historical trajectories. They also bring about a change in the way that we experience ourselves as subjects precisely through the way we relate to these events that happen. Now, I think a lot of times whenever you hear this, it's like, okay, well, that's fine. What the hell is an event then that would qualify for bad you? Well, he actually sees that four realms in which events with a capital E take place, copyright, <laughs> event, capital E, but he also describes these in this book as the four conditions of philosophy. So almost that philosophy can only exist whenever it's relating to one of these foundational events for bad you. So what are the four conditions of philosophy or the four possible realms of events? Well, one, we have science. Number two, we have politics. Number three, we have art. And number four, we have love. Ooh. Live, laugh, love. Live. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, those those are good categories. Like, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that seems pretty comprehensive, though. Yeah. Um, what's outside of that? I almost capitalism. Find it, well, I almost find it interesting <laughs> that religion is not in here. It's, ah, religion. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Which I is, think love. I think love is probably yeah. Sub, you know, like if you were to try to put religion in one of those categories, you would talk about love somehow, like divine love. I don't fucking know. Whatever. But like you know, yeah. yeah. Well, it's really interesting that, uh, you know, Comrade Commissar Don and I have actually read a Bad You book together uh, on St. Paul. And he actually, it's a pretty fascinating book because he tries to explore how Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus is precisely one of these things that qualifies as an event. So I'm going to try to do my best to summarize what I took from that book because I think it lays out exactly what makes events so foundational for him. Sure. So from what I remember of his description of St. Paul's conversion, well, number one, I mean, the fact that he references a religious figure but doesn't include religion in this list, pretty interesting, but maybe it is, <laughs> you know, art, 
politics and love or some combination of those. The way he describes Paul's conversion and what he develops in his his sort of conception of what Christianity is from this is it's sort of a kind of paradox of the ideal and the material existing at the same time. It's almost this sort of dialectical relation between the two, not one or the other, that he sees as being a really core feature of what an event is. It's sort of a material thing that encapsulates some sort of ideal universal essence without collapsing it into one or the other. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I have to tell you, whenever I read that, it's that was my response to it. I'm just like, I kind of nod and I say, eh, okay. Yeah, so some kind of basically describing it as being both material and idealistic at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think and so in like in some sense he's kind of saying it's like this fabric of distinction that we have that just comes from like our everyday ability to keep things in categories and classify all of the events of our lives that yeah. happens day to day gets collapsed by something. Basically, yeah. there's some kind of rupture in our ability to distinguish or differentiate between the ideal and the material for just a moment because of whatever the gravity of the event. Yeah, or if and not so much like sort of collapses our distinction, but it's almost as if it's the place where the distinction breaks down because both are fully present. Hmm. Okay. That's a philosophical shit. That's, I realize yeah, I just said I mean, real philosophy hours on Red <laughs> Library. Um, so here's, a, here's an interesting idea, and I think this is sort of what relates it to this book, because I actually see the book I mentioned earlier, The Communist Hypothesis and Philosophy Communist from... Hippopotamus. <laughs> the Communist Hippopotamus. Hippopotamus. And Philosophy for Militants actually being actually very similar works. They're both very short, very accessible. But here's what's interesting. Badiou describes communism as exactly this kind of event. Hmm. He actually cites the Bolshevik Revolution as being an event. He actually describes the Cultural Revolution in Maoist China as being an event. Okay. So it is a place, again, one of these historical ruptures, I think that's a good word for it, something that breaks the sort of pre-established order or, or like trajectory and is a moment in time in which the material and the ideal somehow exist simultaneously and they kind of embody each other in this strange sort of dialectical way. Okay. What do you make of that? <laughs> So, like, I don't really know. I mean, I'm going to be critical here because I basically was Zizek about all this shit. I don't, I don't, I like event. I like the idea of event, but like, I don't. Um, event? Good. I think that there's, <laughs> I think that there's like some shit that needs to be meted out. Like, you can't just have, <laughs> you can't just have, like, the Listen, there's some shit that needs to be meted out in this whole event thing. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't. How do you just differentiate one event, right, from like some mundane bullshit that happened that was just a big, you know, news gossip column? Like, who knows, right? Like, what what constitutes an event? Like, how will it be recognized by those who who are not somehow subjectivized by it? Right. Well, I think and that's like, one of the interesting things for Badiou is it, from what I remember, and this happens a lot in his book, being an event, but it's this idea that whenever the event happens, we can't actually know what qualifies as that until after the fact, whenever we're occupying a particular subjective kind of experience that arises specifically from that As event. As a result of the event, yeah. And, you know, this goes back to Hegel, right? The idea that wisdom is always Minerva's owl that flies uh, yeah, after yeah. the fact. Yeah, yeah, So I think this is also a very Hegelian kind of notion that okay. philosophy gonna... is always something that the, the subjective position in identifying an event is the thing that always happens after it's already occurred. Yeah, yeah, okay. That may, I mean, I, I was going to go the other way. I was going to I was gonna say it's, it's very psychoanalytic. Right. Like you, yeah. you're thinking of like a trauma that happened. Oh, yeah. That there we somehow go. somehow caused. Right. I'm saying yeah. this with air quotes somehow caused you to feel a certain way about some, you know, some aspect of your life. Right. And so I think a lot of people sort of misinterpret that domain of psychoanalysis is that like traumas are not causes. Right. Like traumas are not. They're sort of like you know, mental receptacles, you know, within which you can throw the garbage of like your your experiences and just say like, oh, it's because of my trauma. Oh, it's because of my trauma. Like, traumas don't cause things, right? Like mm. trauma. And that's why I think sort of on some level, I fundamentally disagree with this idea of event because I feel like what Badiou is invoking is something that, man, if you have the memory for it, you could even harken back all the way back to that other episode that I was in with you. We're talking about uh, Lenin. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, Zizek was talking about working through this like yep. psychoanalytic concept of working through. But that's a little different in the sense that with event, 
what you have is a retroactive appraisal of like what it was yes, that absolutely. led yeah. you to your subjective position mm -hmm. as opposed to only being able to discern your subjective position in like partiality and it's partiality, right? Like, yeah. like I think what Badu is implying here in some sense about event is that there is an event and it has some kind of like ultimately uh, cohesive or fully constituted degree to it and that like people can refer to it and talk about it as though it's a real definite thing as opposed to being something that can only be discerned through the strange subjectivities that come as a result of it right like i don't know i'm more in the zizek camp and so it's hard yeah. for me to just be like yeah kids learn event and, and like i kind of want to like be you know hey kids go out there do thorns. drugs have events <laughs> yeah throw, throw thorns in front of your little yeah. bare feet out there but like but but i do i like the idea you know of of trying to talk about events that pivotally shift a kind of like the whole direction of like how people who consider themselves militants are like politically yeah. involved in a deep way um like how they identify Oh yeah, that was a real banger. I thought it was a real banger. I almost went into a little ASMR voice there. Did you hear that? Man, I'm, this show is really just stuck with me. I'm just doing ASMR at the grocery store now whenever I'm talking to my mom on the phone. It's getting a little out of control. Yeah, I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's totally fine. Big shout out, big thanks to Comrade Alex for coming on to Red Library's new Real Late Night Philosophy Hours. Again, we just kind of made that up on the spot, but hey, I think it sounds pretty cool and we should stick with it. So again, you'll hear him back for part two next week as we get even further into Elaine Badu's Philosophy for Militants and have a hell of a lot more laughs and fun along the way. Until then, remember to keep supporting Red Library, subscribe on iTunes or any other podcast catcher you use. Remember, if you'd like to get in on some of the premium content we're going to be releasing now, head over to our Patreon. The link is in the show notes. You can get access to everything we're going to be putting up there. And for a few dollars more, you can even send suggestions of books you'd like to see us tackle in the future. And then, I don't know, who knows? We'll think of some other cool shit to send y'all's way if you actually want to support us that much. Big shout out to all of our patrons who helped us expand our audio capabilities recently, helped me get this awesome new mic. I, of course, got a very stark red mic to represent my my internal political commitments. I like to represent them through the commodities that I purchase and display to others. Obviously, that's the nature of subjectivity and capitalism, duh. Remember to like the page on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, shoot us an email. Again, all the stuff is in the show notes in case this is your first time listening. I say this every week, so I mean, you're just going to get used to it. It's fine. All right, we're going to see you back here for part two next week, comrades. But in the meantime, keep thinking, keep critiquing, keep analyzing, keep reflecting, Keep joking, keep laughing. Um, what else? Keep hoping, keep dreaming, keep that fire alive. Keep that internal flame of militancy in the Elaine Badu sense burning strong. Whatever the hell that means, we're still trying to figure it out. All right, y'all, take care of yourselves. We'll see you back here next time. Red Library out. Peace. Peace.